And that's not really how it works anymore. These guys don't need the preseason to get in football shape as much as they once did. Now, do they need the reps? Absolutely. Can they get them in practices and joint practices and other situations? They probably can to a greater degree than they once could. And again, with respect to this Eagles team, it is so thin and its margin for error is so small that I think they're doing the right thing by not saying, you know what, let's leave Jalen Hurts out there for a quarter or two because there's so much that you can't control in a preseason game relative to what you can control during a practice, even a joint practice. I doubt do we have our buddy Mike Sielski ready to hop on with us. There's that smiling face. Mike Sielski, thanks for uh, being part of this. How did you get out of going up to Turnpike to watch the Eagles and the Jets practice? Uh, number one, I don't think I'm part of the inner circle of beat writers um, and columnists who get that privilege. Uh, number two, uh, I had a dentist appointment yesterday at 10 <laughs> o'clock in the morning during the window when the Eagles were testing writers for COVID. Um, and so I couldn't get tested in time for uh, the trip up to Florham Park. I would have liked to have gone, um, you know, but I'll just sit here with my vaccine. My, my vaccinated self will stay in my office today and work otherwise. Yeah, Mike, uh, I, I was in the same boat you were. It's it, it was one of those where, you know, you had to go get the COVID testing. And I, I, I always call them the tier one media. I, I guess I'm not considered part of that so I, I i'm like you I, I got too much stuff to do this week i'll i'll rely on mcmullen and everybody else but uh, i kind of wanted to bring this up to you a little bit here do you like the fact that they're not playing jalen hurts as much as they are in the or much as they should be i should say in the preseason i don't like it or dislike it jeff i think it's a necessity i think they are not deep enough to risk playing their starters very much in this preseason. And I think Joe Flacco and Nick Mullins' performances so far um, have borne that out. Um, you, They can't afford to have Jalen Hurts get hurt because Flacco and Mullins have been so bad in this preseason. Um, they ought to put Jalen Hurts in a panic room and keep him there until the flight to Atlanta, you know, the weekend of Sunday, September 12th. Um, and I feel the same way about most of their veteran starters, right? Like, you know, Brandon Brooks is playing on two repaired Achilles tendons. Lane Johnson had ankle surgery. Like the idea that these guys should be playing a lot in the preseason to me is ridiculous. You can't afford to have them get hurt. This roster isn't deep enough to, you know, to plug somebody in. This isn't a situation like in 2017 where if Jason Peters is hurt, you know, you have control V, how pollute vitae there to kind of fill in and still have the line be stable. This is not that kind of situation at all. They they don't have the backups to fill in for these guys. So, no, I, I feel like whether it's Hertz, whether it's Johnson or Brooks or Kelsey or Ertz or Goddard, whoever, like minimize the risk to these guys in the preseason and get them to the to week one healthy. I know I'm going to play devil's advocate here and probably annoy the snot out of Eagles Nation, but facts are facts. That guy, Andy Reid, I think you probably heard of him, former coach uh, out there in Kansas City. He's only gone to two consecutive Super Bowls. He's playing his starters. He's got a quarterback by the name of Mahomes, who they made a kind of financial commitment to, like $300 million. Uh, they, 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 they're they putting out there for more preseason snaps than Jalen Hurts is uh, getting here in Philadelphia. Why wouldn't they follow in Andy Reid's designated playbook? Because it seems to be working pretty well. For Big Red. Yeah, but that's not the norm throughout the league, Jody. It's not. I mean, Tom Brady's... Well, maybe the, the league needs to catch up with Andy Reid. Uh, the league... the. But that's the thing. Like, are you gaining that much? Maybe Andy Reid is gaining this huge advantage over everybody by playing his starters more in the preseason. Or maybe he just has Patrick Mahomes, who's freaking great. Um, you know, I, I don't know if if, if, mo if... if 31 out of 32 teams aren't playing their starters very much... You're not losing anything, in theory, relative to what other teams are doing. And I do think, look, the Eagles have done this for a long time. In 2016, when Sam Bradford was going to be their starting quarterback, he took three snaps in their week one in their preseason opener against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and they got him off the field. And they played in that game Carson Wentz, 
a ton more than they played Bradford or Chase Daniel. And what ended up happening? Carson Wentz ended up getting hurt and, you know, missed the rest of that preseason. Now he was fine in time for the week for week one. You could take this discussion in any number of ways. I do think there are a lot of old time football fans. And I hate framing it that way because I'm becoming one of those old timers with each passing day who remember the days when players used the preseason to get in shape and get sharp. And that's not really how it works anymore. These guys don't need the preseason to get in football shape as much as they once did. Now, do they need the reps? Absolutely. Can they get them in practices and joint practices and other situations? They probably can to a greater degree than they once could. And again, with respect to this Eagles team, it is so thin and its margin for error is so small that I think they're doing the right thing by not saying, you know what, let's leave Jalen Hurts out there for a quarter or two because there's so much that you can't control in a preseason game relative to what you can control during a practice, even a joint practice. I don't know if Eagles fans are aware of this, Mike. Uh, this is one of the reasons why I had them, and I was optimistic here at 8-9. and nine. I think they're starting – you know, 11 on both sides is, I don't want to say it's good, but it's not terrible. It's where the death comes in. That's where it ultimately, that's the difference between the Kansas City Chiefs, Tampa Bay Buccaneers and everybody else, and Buffalo Bills and everybody else. So I, I'm with you. If any of these guys get hurt, that's what I worry. I think that's why some of these guys are on bubble wrap, but I wanted to bring this up too. How do you think Nick Sirianni is handling all, all this? Like I, I basically, I want you to grade like his, his performance so far. He gets an eye. It's incomplete. Um, you know, he's handled, look, he's handled the media much better than he did in his opening press conference. We all would acknowledge that. Um, but in terms of the team's performance, I think it depends on what you think is like, they don't look, they looked bad, obviously against the Patriots. Um, and they looked bad because they are not deep. Their, their backups are not good. They're, they're just not. And so to your point, Jeff, like they can't afford to lose any of their starters because if they do, they don't have the kind of coaches, you know, with the kind of experience that they used to have. You know, I mean, I, I, I to your, you know, to, to the point you kind of raised, Jody. Like I can remember the 2003 Eagles season. Let's go back a ways where they lost Brian Dawkins and Troy Vincent and Bobby Taylor for a stretch, and their secondary was still pretty good with Clinton Hart and young guys like Lito Shepard and Sheldon Brown because the team drafted well and because Jim Johnson was, you know, basically a genius who could figure out how to use those guys. Totally different situation now, you know, totally different. So um, to grade Sirianni, he gets an incomplete, like, you know, there's this disconnect between him preaching competition and, you know, not playing the starters, but I can understand why he's not playing the starters. Um, and my feeling on him, Jeff, is, if the, if the guys he has throughout this season are playing hard for him every week, that's the standard by which to judge him. It is not really whether the team wins a lot of games or loses a lot of games, because I don't think they're going to be very good. I think it's going to be, do they play hard every week? That's what you saw Andy Reed, from Andy Reid his first season, even though they were 5-11. and 11. That team gave it everything it had every single week, and you knew there was something there to build off of because they had McNabb, because they were going to get some free agent uh, money to spend in the offseason, go get John Runyon. I think you have to use kind of the same standard here with Sirianni. Didn't know we were going to get a Clinton Hart reference today, but that's why we have Mike Sielski on to uh, give us that type of stuff. All right, uh, something I asked Jeff in uh, the first hour of the show, got to run by you. Zach Ertz tonight. You told us how you think the Eagles are handling playing time, and it's actually smart because they can't afford to lose them. Zach Ertz, there's multi-purpose to how much he's going to play tonight. I think he could really use the time with Jalen Hurts. But, oh, by the way, Jalen Hurts might not play, and everyone is still clinging to the possibility of another team with tight end as a important position for them, unfortunately dealing with a tragic injury to their top tight end, which would increase Zach Ertz's value. I get that, and I know that it's still in play in part. But I think he's the best Eagles Eagles receiver right now, wide or tight. He's their best receiver. And if they're going to try and win week one, a little bit more work between he and Jalen 
might be a real good thing here in this last exhibition game. Is Zach Gertz even going to have shoulder pads on Friday night when the Jets and Eagles take the field? I'd be surprised. I would be surprised. I mean, look, I think I think team executives and coaches kind of bake this into the bread of the regular season, that, that, the, that the season's going to be sloppy, play is going to be sloppy the first few weeks, and then by like week five, teams are going to start to figure it out. They don't. They don't view the. They they view the preseason as what's what would be the word like something just to get through. The real crime here is that the NFL charges fans full price for these tickets to these games because the teams themselves and the coaches and the players don't regard them in the same way that they used to. They just don't. I mean, you know, I'm sure I know Jody can remember this. And I'm Jeff, I'm sure you can remember this too. I can remember the Eagles second preseason game in the 2004 season where they played the Baltimore Ravens. I believe it was and Donovan McNabb on the first play of the game hit Terrell Owens on a long touchdown pass. And it was like, Oh my God, this is it. This is what we're going to see during the regular season. Look at the difference T.O. will make. And it absolutely was borne out over the next 16, 15, 16 games before Owens got hurt. They were great together. That doesn't exist anymore. Like, we don't know what Quez Watkins is going to be. He might be really good. But just because he took a screen, a, a wide receiver screen, 70-whatever yards, you know, against the Steelers, doesn't mean that he's going to be terrific during the regular season because these teams are just trying to get through this stuff. It's one thing that they're looking at in addition to joint practices, regular practices, off-season workouts, it doesn't have the, the games don't have the cachet that they once did. So I, to answer your question, Jody, I'd be surprised if Ertz suited up for anything more than a snap or two, or if he suited up at all, because even if the Eagles want to move him and think that an opportunity presents itself to trade him, why risk getting him hurt? Then you can't trade him. Like one thing I've been on the fence about, and I've argued for and against it. I think ultimately, I do think they should get a veteran wide receiver in here. Somebody be a trade. I don't think the free agent market's going to be the way to go unless you know a high profile guy gets cut and you get lucky, like Antonio Freeman or someone became available, or you know in two in two thousand two. But ultimately, I don't think this receiving core is going to help Jalen Hurts that much outside of Devonta Smith and potentially Jalen Rager. I, I kind of want to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I can see both sides of it too, Jeff. Um... You know, signing a veteran for the sake of signing a veteran, you know, I, I'm not sure I buy into that. It depends on the veteran you sign, right? You can sign Ruben Randall, and he may get cut in a couple of weeks, like it would happen a few years ago. Um, you know, and at some point, you have to start finding out about guys like, you know, a Jalen Rager and a Devontae Smith. You have to let them play. And, you know, I, it depends on the guy. It depends on the guy it, you would potentially sign, I think, is what it comes down to. And remember, we, they still have guys on the roster like J.J. Ortega-Whiteside and Travis Fulgham who, you know, are technically veterans. Like, they're young guys, but they're not, you know, it's not like they've, they've, they've been here for a few years. Presumably, um, they could fill that – in theory, they could fill that kind of role too. Um, I go back and forth about it. I, you know, I don't know. I, I I, I think probably they, they are not going to do that, and I can see why they wouldn't. When you went Eagles-Ravens preseason, you know where I thought you were going, Mike? The game that got canceled. The turf game. Uh, yeah. Oh, I was yeah. down there on the field because yes. I saw what was happening. It was at the vet, and the turf was bad, and I could see. I was up in the uh, booth, and I got down quickly to the field because I saw all the coaches out there. None of the players were out there yet. This was hours before the game was supposed to schedule to play. I got within listening distance, and Brian Billick was going off. Yeah. I'm not blank bringing my blanking players out on this blank. Amount. You think I'm going to play on this blank? We'll sue your blank if you think we're going to play. It was uh, 10 of the most entertaining minutes I ever had, and I didn't even have to say anything. All I had to do was stand there, sit there, and listen. Uh, very entertaining. But they canceled the game, which means I had to do like an extra hour broadcast because we had to <laughs> fill the time because there was no game that was going to be done. But I got a chance to talk to Merrill for a very long period of time, which was cool. But I digress. Um, this upcoming game, another thing I'm going to try and take out of it, Mike, and I just feel I'm going to be able to learn next to nothing. JG, the new defensive coordinator, which that's what he likes to be called. At least McMullen tells us that. Jay's good with JG. 
I want to know what JG's going to do come week one of the season. I don't know that I've learned anything as to what he's going to do through the first two exhibition games. And uh, most of all three of us uh, don't have the liberty of being able to go and watch them in practice and don't even know how much we would pick up on practice because he's talked as much about deception as he has. And he thinks that's a key element. If they don't know what's coming, your defense could be that much more effective. When are we going to know what kind of defense coordinator Jonathan Gannon is? I would say two or three weeks into the season. Um, I mean, deception is not – I honestly think, Jody, that that's one of the things that has changed about the NFL um, or become a kind of a storyline that gets underplayed a little bit is how much – new coaches and new coaching staffs can help a team's fortunes early in the season. Like that, and it's clearly something that is valued around the league, right? Like teams go full vanilla for the most part in the preseason now. They don't want to show anything. They don't want to talk about showing anything. And I do feel like, you know, you can have a a big advantage or even a big disadvantage uh, if your coaching staff is competent right away or a disadvantage if it's incompetent because teams are figuring out it's going to take teams time to figure out like what you're doing. Like, I think we saw this in 2016 when Doug Peterson took over part of the reason the Eagles got off to that three and O start with Carson Wentz was because new head coach, new quarterback, what are they going to do? And there's no film on them. So, you know, I, I think Gannon probably looks at it the same way. Like I'm sure, I'm sure Sirianni looks at it the same way. Why, why show anything? to Matt Ryan and Art Smith of the Falcons ahead of September 12th. You know, we'll keep it vanilla. Everything will be, you know, a mystery to them. And then maybe we can throw them off, you know, and and gain an edge on them. And I think in some situations that can actually work. Uh, it doesn't work all the time, but, you know, I think it's become kind of prevalent around the league to, to do that. Mike, I don't know if we'll ever get to this point. I think coaches sometimes try to send the message. We don't want these preseason games. Players definitely don't want them, but we know the alternative. It's 18 game regular season or dare I say it 20. I don't think I'll ever happen, but do you think we'll ever see a day, at least in our lifetimes where there's no preseason? I don't, I don't. And I, I kind of hope not. I mean, I think the solution to this is that eventually the NFL is going to, crunch the numbers and try to figure out a way to like lower ticket prices so that people actually go to these games. I know they won't. I see Jody shaking his head, Um, but there, there would have to be a price point. I would think where more people would just look at it and say, okay, well for this number, I'm not going to go to the game, but for this number, I will. I think it'd be smart for the NFL to do that. But um, you know, if the players union has any, um, you know, backbone to it, I I would hope they would stand against it because, you know, the regular season getting up to 17 games in and of itself to me is too long. And uh, 16 was perfect. I know the NFL just wants to make money hand over fist. I get it. But, um, you know, I would hope the players union would, would be serious about it and say, hey, look, 17 is enough. Um, you know, the damage that's being done to our to our representatives is just too much. You know, 20 regular season games with what we know about CTE and the way the body breaks down and all of that stuff. Uh, we can't do it. Mike, you're a good man, and you're uh, trying to put the best interest of Eagle fans and or even players at the top of the list. You know, money's always going to be at the top of the list, so they're not going to do away with preseason games. Um, Question about the Eagles wide receiver core. We want to see Jalen Hurts. We don't know if we're going to see Jalen Hurts in this game. We know we're going to see him as soon as the season starts, and he's going to take every single snap. As long as he's healthy, he's going to play every snap of this entire season this year. And then the Eagles are going to make a decision whether he's their quarterback going forward into 2022 and beyond. Are they giving him a realistic shot to prove what he is if they go into the season with the very young wide receiver core that they have? There have been rumors about them having interest in a veteran wide receiver, which couldn't hurt depending on who the guy is. Smith's a rookie. Rager's a second year. Watkins is a second year. Even Greg Board, who's the veteran of the group, is still wet behind the ears. Is Jalen Hurts getting a fair shake here with this wide receiver group to show whether he is or isn't a franchise quarterback? Probably not. Um, but 
it's the situation that they've got. And in a way, it's a no-lose situation for Hertz. Like if he performs well and is able to put up numbers and play presume, you know, fairly well with this group, that's all the better for him. Um, and I do think that it's possible for this situation to kind of morph and turn. I mean, remember, go back to 2013, 2014. The Eagles at that time talked as if they thought Nick Foles was going to be their franchise quarterback. He was coming off of the 27 touchdown, two interception season in Chip, in Chip Kelly's first year. I was at the draft combine in 2014, heading into the 2014 season. And Howie Roseman sang Nick Foles' praises as a young quarterback that we can build around and he's only going to get better. And I'm sure Jeffrey Lurie felt the same way. And it was only after Foles got injured midway through the 14 season and Chip Kelly decided, you know what? I need Marcus Mariota. I need Sam Bradford. I need an upgrade at that position. And I have the power now to do it um, that they moved on from him the first time. So Lurie can fall in and love in and out of love with quarterbacks and Howie Roseman can to a degree. So I'm not sure how much it would take for Jalen hurts to be able to go to, you know, to show Jeffrey Lurie in particular and Howie Roseman to a lesser degree. Hey, I can be your guy. And you don't need to trade everything for Deshaun Watson, presuming that Deshaun Watson is able to play for any NFL team, given the stuff that he's got going on. And, you know, let's see, let's roll with Jalen Hurts. Um, I also think from a team building standpoint, and I've written this in the past, having a quarterback who's pretty good on a rookie contract is, is a pretty good thing. If you can... Have, if you have the salary cap room to, to add pieces around him. I mean, let's face it, that's how the Eagles won the Super Bowl. They, they spent less money under the cap on Carson Wentz and Nick Foles and were able to add all these veteran pieces who turned out to be really good pieces. And in the end, they were able to win a Super Bowl even without their starting quarterback. So um, I think the situation is pretty fluid. But to, to come back to your question, Jody, it, it is what it is. You know, is it fair? No, it's probably not. But Let's see what Hurts can make of it. And maybe he doesn't have to be Aaron Rodgers or Patrick Mahomes or Tom Brady to show that he can be a guy who the Eagles commit to for at least a few more years. Mike, I'm a little worried about this. You know, I'm just looking at it from a fan's perspective. It kind of feels like a process year. I hate to I hate to say that, but the Eagles fans are going to be watching what the Colts are doing, and they should be watching what the Dolphins are doing because they have their picks. I'm if the Eagles get off to a bad start, which I kind of think they're going to because of that schedule, doesn't it kind of feel like I, I don't want to say it's the full Sixers tank job here, but it definitely feels like I, I know they'll never use the term rebuild, maybe transition, but doesn't it kind of feel like that? To a degree, yeah. I mean, as much as a transit, you can have a transition year in the NFL, Jeff. I mean, I'm not a big believer in rebuilding in the NFL because player attrition is so prevalent. Um, you know, the average lifespan career span of an NFL player is two or three years. Um, so many guys get released, cut injured in an, in an off in a season or an off season, a team can remake itself very quickly in the off season. Um, you know, is it a transition year in that regard? Yeah. In that usually the Eagles go into every season saying our goal is to win the division. And we have a realistic shot at that. Even when they're bad, like they were last year, the presumption was, well, we're going to win the NFC East because we have Carson Wentz and Deshaun Jackson will come back and blah, 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 blah. So it's different in that regard in that we don't really know what they're going to be, but we think they're probably going to be pretty bad. And yeah, like I understand fans looking ahead to, oh, well, we can get this draft pick or we can get the, that draft pick or whatever. But I, in the NFL, that guarantee, that doesn't guarantee you as much to me as it might in the NBA, right? Um you know, you get a top five pick in the NFL, you're still more liable to screw that up, I think, more than a top five pick in the NBA. Um, the Sixers' evidence over the last seven or eight years notwithstanding. We'll get to the NBA. I do want to ask about the rise. But before we get there, since you brought him up, Nick Foles, third string, Chicago Bears. No questions asked. Uh, Justin Fields, it looks like right now, is going to be the backup. And they're going to go with Andy Dalton as the starter. Nick Foles is a third string, doesn't really fit there. He's probably not happy. I don't know if the Bears are going to keep three quarterbacks or not. Most teams do. Would they really keep Nick Foles, who was told he was going to be the starter when they picked him up last year and now has been all the way dropped to third? 
Can he talk his way out? And if he does, if he hits the open market, I don't know about you, but I think that uh, the Eagles could actually use an upgraded quarterback because Nick Mullen stinks. He's not an NFL quarterback in my mind. But Nick Foles comes with more than just his skills and his capability. He comes with a lot of history. Do the Eagles want to reopen that door? I wouldn't. I wouldn't. You just look in a vacuum. Yeah. And I said the same thing about drafting Jalen Hurts in 2020. In a vacuum, that move makes sense. You have a franchise quarterback who you've just signed to a gigantic contract. You don't want to spend more money at the position than you than you already have. If you draft a guy high, you can get him on his rookie contract. And if he's competent, if Wentz gets hurt, you have a, a cost-effective alternative. And you can develop him. And if Wentz really gets hurt, maybe you've got a guy who can play and, and become something. And if Wentz comes back, then you can maybe trade this kid. That sounds great in a vacuum. The reality was drafting Jalen Hurts sent Carson Wentz off on – I've been betrayed by the organization. I'm not the man. The Eagles totally misread how Wentz would react to that situation. I put blame on both sides, both for Wentz and both on Wentz and the Eagles. And it became so bad that so toxic you had to trade Carson Wentz. In a vacuum, you're right, Jody. Nick Foles is a veteran quarterback, can step into a situation, is familiar with Philadelphia, et cetera, et cetera. This is not a vacuum. This is Nick Foles is a Super Bowl hero in Philadelphia. And if you bring him in, you're undercutting Jalen Hurts because the pressure to play him would be so great that it would cause a sideshow, I think, that the Eagles should avoid. Um, and they should have learned their lesson from what happened just a couple of years ago um, with Hurts and with Wentz coming back in 2018 after he had won the Super Bowl with Foles still there over his shoulder. Mike, I want to bring this up with Andy Reid again. Um, I dug a very interesting stat about him. Um, and he can do this this year. He's the only head coach to take two different teams to three straight conference style games. He has the opportunity to do that now with the Eagles and the Chiefs four consecutive, and that that's only been done seven times in NFL history. Where do you see Andy Reid? It, 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 and I'm going to assume he does this this year, and the Chiefs win the Super Bowl. We'll we'll go in the crystal ball a bit. Where does he rank among like the greatest head coaches ever at this point? He's moving up the rankings. I mean, he's a, he's a slam dunk Hall of Famer. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt about that anymore. I think in terms of his influence around the league, it's something that I, I don't think people in Philadelphia really appreciate. I've written about this. What he did in terms of uh, allowing offensive concepts that had been bubbling below the NFL surface in college and even at high school to come up to the NFL – um, is, has in some ways revolutionized the league. Uh, you look at his coaching tree and the number of head coaches around the league who worked for Andy Reid. Um, he's, I, I mean, you can make an argument that Andy Reid's a top 10 head coach of all time in this league and moving up with a bullet. Um, and I know th there's a segment of the, the Eagles fan base that will hate him forever, that will mock him for times yours and, and, not winning a Super Bowl and getting all those championship games and not winning them and et cetera, et cetera. But Andy Reid is an all-time great NFL head coach. He is. And, um, yeah, I think people should recognize him as such. So uh, since you gave just a, such a glowing uh, retrospective of Andy Reid, I assume you expect he's going to his third consecutive Super Bowl? I'd be surprised if they didn't. I think Buffalo's got a chance. Uh, they're, they're the lone team in the AFC did. I yeah, think. But who's the, who's Buffalo's head coach, Jody? Sean McDermott and Andy Reid. That's who's off the Andy <laughs> Reid tree. <laughs> Very true. Yeah, yeah. Either way, it's an Andy Reid win. <laughs> I see where you go with that. Uh, <clears throat> I got a win-win uh, right there. <laughs> All right. Uh, one last thing for me and Mike. We appreciate greatly that you came on the show today. Um, has there been a guy in Eagle camp? And I'm going to take. Devonta Smith out of the equation because he was the 10th overall pick of the draft. And it's very easy to say the number one pick. Uh, but someone other than Devonta Smith, who you've seen, rookie and or addition from outside, or even a guy who hasn't had a chance to, bl uh, to play yet and has been here for a year or two that you think is just going to blossom. Is there a guy that's caught your attention either through the grapevine with practice and or in the two exhibition games? I think it's kind of hard to say the exhibition games because they haven't been real good. 
But is there a guy that you're uh, excited about watching this year that you think he's got a chance to uh, overachieve and or blow by expectations? Uh, I would say three guys. I would say we talked about him earlier, Quez Watkins. I'm curious to see if he can translate what he's done in the practices in the preseason and even what he flashed a little bit last season into, uh, you know, the regular season over the long term. Josh Sweat, um, I, I'm, I'm eager to see him. I'm, I'm always most curious, Jody, about guys who, like, take a big leap after a couple of years in the league. Like, you know, does it just – take time for them to physically mature, to gain some experience. We saw flashes again from sweat last season, um, you know, high pressure and sack ratio relative to the number of times he was on the field. He's going to be on the field more often. I think I want to see more from him. And then the last guy would be Alex Singleton, who had an excellent season last year for them at linebacker and has continued that so far. And who I think that's interesting to me because the Eagles haven't had playmakers at linebacker in a long time, they haven't valued that position. And so they kind of stumbled into it with Singleton. And I w- I'm curious to see if he continues to play as well this season as he did last season. And, it, and as he did during, you know, in that Patriots game, he was pretty good in that Patriots game, Yeah, he was which, was, so- which was otherwise not good in any regard. One of the lone shiners for the Eagles yeah. in that Patriot game. You are correct there. All right. Uh, give us the details on the rise. Your Kobe Bryant book. I know I, I think I read fall was when it was officially going out, but people can pre-order ahead of time. What's the deal with the rise? Uh, so the rise, uh, Kobe Bryant and the pursuit of immortality hits stores on January 11th. Oh, you not can pre- Why did I think it was fall? I thought it was going to be fall too, but they, um, they wanted it after the new year. Um, it's publishing logic. I, I don't, I don't know it. Uh, or get it. I would have thought Christmas would have been a good time, but they want it. <laughs> they want it for January. Um, you can pre-order it now on Amazon and McMillan's, uh, you know, the publishing house's website. We're also going to have, I'm also in the midst of writing and uh, producing a podcast called Young Mamba that uh, it's going to be available um, to listen to in November or December. I'm writing scripts for that and I'm going to start narrating it too. It's going to be a 10 part narrative podcast about Kobe. And his young life is going to complement the book. So, uh, you know, look for stuff related to that as well in the weeks to come. Well, you know, we're going to have you on before the uh, podcast starts and certainly before the book comes out. Mike, thanks for hopping on with us today. We'll get back to you again soon enough, brother. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Mike Sielski, uh, veteran columnist, has been covering the Philadelphia sports scene. Does it all, but uh, we're Birds 365, so we tap into his eagle expertise whenever he jumps on board with us. Us being Jody McDonald and Jeff Kerr. We'll come back. Final time out. Put a bow on the show. A couple more things to touch on before we get to uh, the Eagles and the Jets. Inter-squad practices, joint practices today here on Birds 365. If you missed any of today's show on the Jacob Media channel, listen to the podcast on your way home. Available on YouTube, Apple, and Spotify.